In this video, we're going to be exploring the console object. And I bet there's going to be a few things here that I mentioned that you didn't know about. If you haven't seen it before, this is the console object. The console object lets us interact with the console. But what's the console? Well, the console is the web developer tools. So this is Chrome over here. And if I click on the three dots, go to more tools, go to developer tools. This is the console that I'm referring to. This console object over here lets us interact with this console area here in the web developer tools. There are other tabs like elements, but the area that we're going to focus on is console. If you happen to enjoy this video, please subscribe, like, and share. Let's start with the most basic usage of console to write a message onto the console, and then we're going to move on to some really cool stuff. So let's take a look at writing that message. Normally, what you would do is you do a console.log to log a message. Now, console.log can take any number of arguments. For example, we can just pass a string in it and say hello. That hello will then appear here in the console. If you wanted to, we could use the first argument kind of more as a descriptor and say it's in the app.js file. And then we could have a second part of that, which could be an object. And that object could have, say, a name and print that out. Then what we would get is we get the name printed like this and then an object. You might not be aware of this one, actually, is you can have more than one object in your console.log. Let's take a look at this example over here. We have this console.log, it's got a string, an object, and then another object, and we'll just say this one over here is Tim. So now when we print it out, we're going to get more objects printed here, and you can have as many as you want. So this is something you typically don't see. Normally what you'll see is you'll just see a single console log, but what I like to do sometimes to know where it's coming from, I have this first argument as a string, and then the object that I'm interested in and what that data is, so I can explore more of it when I'm in the console. When you print an object out in the console, you can then expand it to inspect it and see what information's available on it. Console.log is great for writing messages out to figure out what your application's doing. There are also other types of messages that you can write. So for example, we can also write a console.warn. If we do console.warn, and then we give it a message, and it takes the same arguments. We can give it multiple arguments if we want, or just a single argument. So for example, here I could write something happened, and it will print out a warning message. What's nice about the warning message is it's more prominent because it shows up as yellow. Also, within our console, we have the ability to filter the type of messages that we want to see. So what we can do within our console over here is if we click on default levels over here, you can see it says info, warning, and error. So error is the ty next type of message we're going to print out. But if I wanted to not show warning messages, I could uncheck that and then only show regular messages. If we go back to our custom level over here and we unclick info, then you see the app.js one go away. So let's enable those for now so we can see all our messages. Let's take a look at error messages. So error messages very similar. We just do a console.error and we can do just like we did before. We could say the error happened in app.js. We could give it an object. Maybe that object has the error type or something like that, letting us know the type of error. Maybe this was a data error or something like that. So then when we print that out, it gives us that initial little text over there and then an object that we can expand and explore if it had more information. And it's nice. We got our info messages, our warning messages, and our error messages. Here's one that I bet you didn't know about. Within our console over here, the nice thing is that if we get too many messages while we're running our application, we can always click that clear console over here. This little uh, circle with a line through it clears the console. But you can also do that through code. So let's get those messages back. I'm just clicking save here and they all appear. Now, if I want the messages to appear, I can also go into my console here and type console.clear. And that will clear all the previous messages. It's return values undefined, but you can see the console was cleared. And then within our code, if our application's running and we get to a certain point and we're like, well, we want to clear all the messages, we can also do that from our JS file over here. So now when I type console.clear, hit save. Now you can see the application refreshed and the other messages are gone. If I comment to this out over here, our messages come back. Let's take a look at one of my favorite console operations, console.table. So over here, I'm just going to clear the console so that we have nothing on the screen over here. And let's say that we had this data structure over here. This data structure over here is an array. As you can see, it has two items inside the array. They both have a name and they both have a favorite color. Now, what we could do is we could just simply use console.log to go ahead and print that information to the console, which then shows up like this. 
it's not too bad. We can expand that information and look at it. But let's say that we want to show this in a more pleasing way. So we could type console.table.data. Then we get a table within our console, which is so cool. So over here, we have the index of the item. And then in addition to that, what we have is the column headings and then the information printed below, which is much easier to read. What's cool about this table is that you can actually sort these columns over here. So you can see I'm clicking on name and it's changing the sort order. Same with the favorite color and also with the index. All right, here's my favorite usage of console.table, using it with a REST API. So over here, I've opened up JSON placeholder this website over here, and I have the comments endpoint over here. You can see that it's an array and that there are objects in here with lots of data. So let's go ahead and get that data. So I've, I've just written that code just now. So what we're going to do is we're just creating a function over here that we can use async with. We're going to go ahead to that response, go ahead and access that URL over here. It's going to return a response. We'll go ahead and ask for the JSON data. So we have to do another await. And then let's just say that we wanted to print that out over here. So if we did a console.log, it would look like this. Let me save that. Executing that function right over here, by the way, we get 500 items. And there are 500 items that are not really easy to look at because I need to expand every single one of these to see that information. But flip that over to a table. And then we get this table here that we can scroll through that we also sort. So it's actually really cool that we're able to sort this information and we're able to view it all on one thing. So if I expanded my you know, screen a little bit more, it'd be a little bit easier to read to see those columns. You can also change the column sizes here. But if I'm looking for something in particular and I just want to sort it, this makes it kind of easy. So one of my favorite examples is applying the console.table to the results of a REST API endpoint. Let's just clean up our screen a little bit. So I'm just going to comment out the get data over here. And then I'll also do a console clear so that it just gets rid of all that information. Next, we're going to look at making a timer or a stopwatch using the console. The console has this built in time method. When you execute it, it will start a timer. So if you don't provide any arguments, it's going to use the default one, but we could have several timers. So we could write one timer and just call it Adam's timer over here. Now we can make a default timer as well, and we'll just execute it. And that will be the default timer. So there's two timers right now. There's Adam's timer and one that has no name. Now, if I do console.time log, that's going to tell me how much time has gone by. For this one over here, 12.69 has gone by. That's just the default timer. But if I want to know how long Adam's timer has gone on for, all I have to do is type console log, pass in Adam, and that'll tell me how much time that timer has been running for. The last thing that you can do with your timer is you can stop it. To stop your timer, all you have to do is call console.timeend. So we'll just do console.timeend, and then you can give it the name of the timer that you want to stop. So the Adam timer will now be stopped. You can see it says Adam over here, and it tells me the amount of time. Now, if I go back here and I actually try and access the atom timer, it'll tell me that it doesn't exist anymore because we called console.time end. Meanwhile, our other timer is still going on, the default one, the one that has no name. We could then also take that one and do time end and stop that timer. So timers can be extremely useful in your application if you want to measure performance or how long something takes to do. It'd be a really great feature to use and you don't have to do anything custom with date time. You can just use the built-in console.time. Here's another one that is really cool. It's kind of like console.time, but it just involves counting. So this one is called console.count. So every time I call console.count, you're going to see that the value increments. Since we didn't give it a name over here, it just says default and default three. So let's say that we wanted to count something else. We want to count the number that a button was clicked. We'll just say button click. So every time I call that, it will tell me the number of times the button was clicked. We could even count the number of cars, say that we had cars in our application, then we could just go ahead and count that. So every time we call cars, it'll give me that different number. So just to mix it up over here, I'll just call I'll call the one that we have above over here down here. And then we get button clicks is four. So you can see that they're all incrementing differently. The other nice thing about console.count is that you can actually clear it. It's actually really simple to clear. All you have to do is console.count reset and then give it the name that you want to clear. So we can clear cars. So the next time we call cars over here, so you don't see any output when that happens, 
but then I put cars and now cars starts back at one, even though cars was at three. So the next time you consider making a global variable to track a number, consider using console.count. Let's take a look at this interesting one called console.trace. So I've created this function over here called log message. Log message calls console.trace. But log message, this function up here is actually called by foo. So I'm going to go down over here and I'm going to execute foo. When foo gets executed, it's going to go in here, call log message, and then log message will call console.trace. I'll click save and we get this kind of stack trace over here. It tells us the order in which things were called. First on line 53, which is where foo was, it's anonymous. It's the main opening of our application. There's nothing else. So it's telling me line 53 was called. Then line 50 was called. So you read this backwards. So line 50 was called over here. It called log message. And then on line 46, that's where console.trace was called. So this can be useful in your code if you want to know like how your method got called. Execute this method over here, and then you can follow it from here all the way down to see where that method was actually invoked. Lastly, let's take a look at grouping messages. So I'm going to go ahead once again and just clear what we have on the screen. Then we're going to create some groups. So let's start by doing our first group over here. So we'll do console.group and we'll call this performance info. So now this is going to create a group. You can see already we get this little expanded area right here, nothing inside it. Then if I go ahead and type console.log and I just say test. So now our message appears inside the test and it's inside this expanded area, which I can expand or collapse. I can add more messages. They all say test. Maybe they say something slightly different, but you can see that we have all these messages neatly packed away. Except the problem is every time I type console.log, it's putting it inside that group. Well, if I want to exit that group, that is simple as well. All we have to do is a group end and that will close the group. So then that group is closed. Now, if I write another message, it'll be outside the group like that. See, that's outside the group. If I collapse this here, it's outside it. Then if I want to make another group, now this time let's create a different group. We're going to create a group that is collapsed. So pretty simple. All we have to do is group collapse like that. And we'll just call this stats and that will open up a new group. Now let's go ahead and first type a message inside here and we'll do info like that. So now I can expand this little area. It automatically opens up closed. This one opens up open and that's kind of nice is these groups. You can also nest groups if you want. So we could do another group inside here. That's more. And then it gets a little bit confusing because now I need to expand this one, this one and the info. So then I'd have to close my group. So right now stats info is going inside stats more. So over here at the end, we'd have to go ahead and close that right there. That would close that area. And then if I do another console.log test over there, expand this area right here. You can see test is now inside of stats, so same area, and then we can go ahead and close that. Groups can be really great for optional data that maybe you don't want to look at all the time, and maybe there's a lot of it. Now recall our get data over here. So when I call get data, it does a console.table. Now what we could do instead is I could take this function over here, roll on down to the bottom, and what we're going to do is we're just going to make a collapsed group. So we'll do group collapsed, and this will be our comments from the REST API. So we can just do comments from REST API, and then I'll call that function over there, hit save. Now look, we have comments from REST API, and it's automatically collapsed. As soon as I expand that area over there, we're going to get all of our table data there for here. I can only go into it when I need it, or I can just collapse it if I don't need it. So that's a use case where these are useful. So you may find that you might want to group your messages together so that they're easier to read if you're doing some profiling against your application or just want some useful information that's developer only in your console. In this video, I hope that you learned some really cool things you can do with a console. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and share.